So um, welcome to this month's No session on uh, talking about stir shaking. Um, just a quick agenda for today. Let's see, here we go. Um, Donald is going to talk about some recent regulatory industry news, uh, and then I'm going to do a deep dive into authentication. Uh, last month was public key infrastructure. Uh, this month will be authentication. And then after that, uh, we're going to kind of leave some time for discussion questions um, about uh, stir shaking. Before we get started, just a quick background uh, about TransNexus for, for those who don't know. Uh, TransNexus was founded in 1997. We're a software company. We provide software for for shaking, of course, uh, robocall prevention, telecom fraud prevention, routing, uh, and a number of other um, you know, services related to telecom. Um, the presenters today are, are going to be myself. I'm a software engineer. Uh, and then Donald, uh, who, who's our pro product marketing manager. Uh, let Donald introduce himself, and, and at that, I'll hand it over to him to talk about the recent news. Uh, thank you, Alec. Uh, yes, I look after uh, marketing at TransNexus, and I also follow uh, the news and regulatory uh, happenings uh, in the industry. And there are a few things to cover since our, we last met to discuss stir shaking. And I'll give you a quick update before we get into the deep dive topic on authentication. So uh, recently, as is required by the Trace Act, the FCC issued a notice of proposed rulemaking for uh, ways to prevent one ring scams. This was actually written into the Trace Act legislation that was signed into law at the end of December. If you're not familiar, this is uh, it, probably everybody on this call is familiar, but this is a scheme where a fraudster sends a uh, one ring phone call to a bunch of people. And they hear the ring and they wonder who was that. And then they get another one and they get another one and it may be in the middle of the night. So they call back to give the caller a piece of their mind and they've called an expensive number. And uh, the Trace Act specifically carved out a, a call for the FCC to combat this. And so in their, we mentioned it here because in their uh, proposed rulemaking, the FCC asked for comments on a number of different aspects about what rig scan prevention. And one of them is they asked for comments on how stir shaken might be paired with call analytics uh, to combat that. So that's a, an interesting thing. And, you know, in general, we do think that call analytics paired with stir shaken is, is the most powerful combination. And, and they're interested in comments from you know, stakeholders. How do you think that will help us combat that? Um, and then just recently, last Friday, comments were due on an FCC order uh, and further notice of proposed rulemaking to implement the Trace Act. And uh, normally when they send out these things, they might get you know, 30, 35 or so uh, sets of comments from interested parties. And they got a bunch <laughs> this time. They got uh, 46 that we've counted. Um, and there are some really interesting uh, questions raised. We're still going through that and and uh, looking for themes, and we've noticed a few that would, we can share with you here. And then just yesterday, the uh, ADIS, IPN, and I met to continue their discussion about a band shaken. And if you're not familiar, that's a way to send the shaken identity token separately out of band from the originating provider to the terminating provider so that you know that it could be it survives transit whereas if you put it in the SIP signaling it may not survive if it has to cross over a non-IP segment it won't survive and the uh, the caller and the called party won't get the benefits of stir shaking so this is under discussion it at us and they uh, just go through all the different facets of this what about this what about that various use cases and one of them that they documented was how would this work for toll free so they're they're going through that and and they have uh, posted notes in the current uh, document that they're working on to describe how this would work. So with that, I'll go over a few themes that we found in the, uh, if you could go to the next slide, thank you. Um, these are a few themes. There, there are a ton of documents, 46, and some of them are quite lengthy, so there's a lot to go through, but here's a few things we noticed. Um, Right off the bat, uh, many of the smaller provider cons 
providers are concerned that, hey, you know, we upgraded our network, we have IP enabled equipments, um, but we still can't participate in Stir Shake and we're afraid we're going to be shut out you know, and our customers won't get the benefits of verified calls inbound and having their calls signed outbound and they're gonna get left out. And the reason is even though we have an IP enabled network, uh, we have to connect to the PSTN through a tandem switch. And uh, we are given the option in some cases to connect to an IP interconnect, but it's a it's a long way away. It's very expensive to haul my traffic to that meet point. So this came up with a number of different um, filings and comments and ex partes. Um, uh, a bigger thing before, we've seen this before going back a year or so, people have made this comment, but now it's more people are jumping on the bandwagon. And in that context, uh, several parties mentioned out of band methods, and that's gonna be a future deep dive topic. In a couple uh, sessions, uh, we'll go through that as part of this stir shaking call. There were also a, a number of comments that uh, discussed the requirements for access to numbers. You may recall from our last session that there are three requirements um, in order to get a certificate to sign calls. And the third requirement is you have to have access to numbers. Uh, and some commenters said, well, some intermediate carriers don't have that, and you're asking them to sign calls uh, as an intermediate carrier. If it's an unsigned call, they should sign it so we get some trace back, but they don't have, they can't meet that third requirement, so they can't sign calls. So this doesn't, you know, this doesn't work that way. So there were some suggestions that they should drop that requirement. And there were also just further comments on whether intermediate carriers should or should not. As you may uh, recall from our last meeting, the FCC did not include that in their order. There, there were two parts to the document. The order, what, they, what they've already decided to require that a bunch of what ifs uh, for their notice and proposed rulemaking, what should we do? They said, we, we think we should ask uh, intermediates to sign calls as well, but we want to uh, have some discussion about that further discussion. And a number of the commenters uh, waited on that. It also, um, so a number of commenters questioned the benefits of the gateway SEAT testation. They're concerned that there could be a flood of these things. Uh, is that really beneficial? And, and some felt it may not even be as necessary anymore. The original intent was that it would make traceback easy. So with a CE attestation, uh, the, the organization that signed the call says, I don't know about this customer, they're used to that number, but I can at least tell you I put it on the network here if you want to trace it back. And some commenters said, well, that, that's, there could be a ton of CE attestation. Are they really worth it? Is that valuable? It would that flood the network with C. So um, that was a, an interesting turn of events and turn of thinking. And then uh, every, every time there's comments, there are some people who uh, make calls for call centers and businesses and enterprises that they're concerned about overly broad blocking, getting caught up in the analytics trap. And they say, and they, we uh, wait it again to say, you know, the FCC has to make sure that uh, carriers provide adequate redress mechanisms to say, if my calls got caught in an analytics trap, how could I resolve that? Uh, you know, there needs to be a way to do that. And so there were a number of comments about that. And uh, with that, we'll go on. Thank you, Donald, uh, for, for that very useful information about uh, all these FCC filings and, and other recent news. It's, uh, it's a lot going on with stir shaking and, and uh, it really does change quite regularly. So uh, hope, hopefully get some, some new information, some new call flows to, to talk about that next next month uh, as well. And with that, I think we'll, we'll, we'll dive into our deep dive topic, which is gonna be shaken authentication. So so last uh, last call we dove into the PKI, the, the public key infrastructure used in Stir Shake, and here we're gonna dive into the, the authentication, which is what is done by the originating service provider. Uh, next month, we'll look at the verification, which is done by the terminating service provider when they receive a call. I do wanna just really quickly, in case anyone missed or forgot our last 
last call, uh, just highlight on the, on the things that are least important for this topic um, that we talked about last month. And that, that is kind of this triangle of trust. So stir shaking is based on this, this triangle of trust where certificate authorities issue certificates to telephone service providers. And, and all of these, these parties are, are kind of administered by this governance authority and the policy administrator well, they administer the policies set by the governance authority. So the, the kind of ecosystem is limited in, in trust using these certificate authorities and, and telephone service providers, or lists of telephone service providers, I should say. So to make this all work, the first thing before you can actually sign a call, before you can authenticate a call, is you have to have a certificate. Uh, and so, I, I, again, I, I discussed this last month, but I want to focus on the, the kind of thing I didn't really mention as much. So you're, as an originating service provider, you're going to have a key management service. And it's going to generate a key pair, which has a, a public key and a private key uh, pair. And your private key, as the name implies, is meant to be private. Uh, very important that you keep that secure. That's how you're actually going to sign the calls here uh, that we're going to talk about in just a moment. And that public key is what, what kind of goes through the rest of this process that's sent to other people. The private key is just placed in a secure key store within your network and never leaves that. No one else ever has that private key. Uh, and the private key is used to sign a call, and then the public key, which is embedded in the certificate, can be used to verify that call. So now that we've kind of just done that quick overview of the, the, the call, the, the pre-call flow, now we can look a little bit more at the call flow. So as a an OSP and originating service provider, when you receive a call from one of your subscribers, that call is going to get sent up to your authentication service, which is going to sign that call. And it's going to have to contact your secure key store, which is where that private key is stored, and either get the key out of it or request that the secure key store actually do the, the signing itself of the token that this creates. There's a couple different ways that can, that can end up being deployed. But that key is what's used to create the signature on that uh, on that token that you're that, that you're signing, and then that token is what what passes through the network and gets verified by the other party. Again, we won't talk much about the verification. Uh, this call that'll be for for next month. But now the first thing I, I want to show this identity header. Um, oh, I can't highlight. I'm actually going to back out of the slide presentation here. There we go. So this is an identity header that would be in a SIP invite. Um, let me just make this a little bigger. There we go. So this is an identity header that's in a, a SIP invite. And it's, it's composed of three parts. And I'm going to talk about those parts in a little bit more detail um, but in a moment. But the, the three parts are right here. You've got the, the, the first part, and then a period, the second part, and then the third part here. And those first two parts I'm going to talk about in a moment. But this third section here, this is the signature. This is what you create with that private key based on the contents of, of this these first two parts, which we'll, we'll go into a little bit more. And this is what no one else could create uh, without having your private key, which is kind of where all the cryptography goes. Now, looking at those first two sections, they're, they're really kind of the header and the payload, and, and the payload being the most important. But we'll start with the header. The header is really just kind of metadata. It's information about this token um, that can be used so that you can verify that token. You need to know, you know what algorithm was used to generate that signature, which again is the third part of that token. Um, what type of token is it? It's a, a passport uh, of the shaken type. Um, and then where do you get the certificate to verify this token? That's kind of all this information in that order, where X5U being the, the location of the certificate repository and we'll, we'll talk more about how that works with the, the verification deep dive next month. But the payload, this is really the heart of the shaken, the shaken token. This is what really matters. Um, so the first thing we've got here is an attestation level. And this is what, as a service provider, you are attesting to. You know, there's three values, A, B, and C, with A being the highest level of attestation and C being the lowest. And Donald kind of touched a little bit about this uh, with their, the C attestation and some carriers having opinions about you know, the benefits of C. We're going to talk a lot more detail about those attestation levels here in just a moment. But, but first, I, I do want to overview the, the rest of the fields here. So the next field is this destination number. Um, and the destination number is, is really pretty simple. It's just the, the dialed telephone number. Um, it's just used so that someone can't create an identity token for one call 
And then a bad guy couldn't take that token and put it on a different call. So it actually has the destination and the origination, the calling number in the token so that you couldn't put it with a different SIP invite. It prevents you from trying to reuse that token for a different call. And on that same note, there's also a timestamp um, issued at is what this is. And that is, again, to prevent the reuse of that token for a different call so that the token is only valid for this calling number, calling that call ed number at approximately that time. Um, now the Ridge ID is the other piece of information that carriers have a lot of control over. And again, we're gonna talk about that a little bit more, but this, this is, these two pieces of information, the Ridge ID and the attestation level are, are the, the two pieces of information that carriers get to set and that you need to identify how you wanna set those values. Let me uh, make this big again, here we go. So now looking at those attestation values, there's three attestation values, A, B, and C. And, I, and we'll start with the top about the requirements that have to be met for you to use those attestation values. And, and I'll tell you right now, your customers, the enterprises especially, but, but definitely your, your consumer customers as well, if you, if you have any, um, are really going to want the highest level attestation. Because when we start talking about what phones are going to do to display to the, the call-ed call party that this call has been signed, it's going to be very different depending on what attestation level is. You know, an attestation level C is likely not going to result in any positive indicator that says this is for sure a good call versus an attestation A is, is likely to result in the best indicator. And B, I'm not sure what that's going to end up looking like. I think that remains to be seen um, with what phone manufacturers and what the service providers choose to do on that verification side. But so looking at attestation level A, to sign a call attestation level A, these are the three requirements directly out of the standard. Um, so you have to be the originating point for this call on the IP network. So, you know, th this is to say that you can't have a call from an, another carrier that, that you're receiving and, and sign that attestation L A. Um, this is, you're originating the call. You are the originating service provider. You have to have a direct authenticated relationship with the customer so you can identify the customer. Whether that being, you know, a hosted PBX scenario where your customer has phones in their office and they're registered to a hosted PBX that, that you know, you're maintaining, or even a SIP trunk, um, that is is technically um, would met, meet that requirement because you know this call came from Bank of America um, down that Bank of America trunk, let's say. And then the third requirement is you have to have established verified association with the telephone number used for the call. And this, this is to say you have to know that the customer using that calling number should be using that calling number. And a lot of times that requirement is, is confused with meaning that you have to own the number as a carrier. That's not what it is saying. It by no means is intending to say that. In fact, uh, the, the, the ADIS has set out a very clear policy that says you do not, under any circumstances, have to own the number. And when you're verifying a call, you should not, actually you must not, check that the call calling party that signed it also owns the number because some carriers implemented that in their networks and that, that was not the correct behavior. So if you have a Bank of America, I'll use them back as an example, uh, and they're using a number that you know that they should be using, you can do attestation level A. Um, if you have, Let's say, you know, like the big wireless carriers, most of those situations, the handsets actually aren't setting the calling number that's actually set within the IMS core. So the handsets, you know, register to the, the, the network. And when the call comes, leaves, you know, that, that iPhone or whatever phone it is and goes into the, their core of their network, it actually sets the calling number there. So there's no way a, a you know, customer could spoof the number. So those are all, of course, at the station level A. Now, at the station level B is the same first two requirements. The difference is that at the station level B, you do not have a verified association that the telephone number is being used. It has been, assigned, been given to that customer, just they don't have authorized use. And so an example is this, let's say you have that relationship with Bank of America. Again, they use their number, that's at station A, but they use some number that you don't know. And you, you know who the customer is, you know that's Bank of America, you have a relationship with them, but they're using a number you didn't give them. You or you didn't give them and you don't know where they got it from. They could be spoofing, you're not sure. That's attestation B. Now again, 
Bank of America, I'm using an example, but anybody, they're not going to like attestation level B because that's a lower level of indication. So what most enterprises and carriers look like the way this is kind of going to work is that you're going to use a letter of authorization or some other verification method where, you know, let's say, I'll, I'll just use AT&T and Verizon, two big wireless carriers as an example here. AT&T um, sells Bank of America a, a phone number and Bank of America happens to route that call out Verizon, maybe because it's cheaper or maybe because their AT&T trunk was down at that moment, whatever the reason may be. They don't want to have that be at the station level B. So Verizon would potentially work something out with Bank of America to verify that Bank of America does in fact, or has been given that number by AT&T and then Verizon can sign that call A, just like AT&T will call, sign that call A. And of course, AT&T already knows that Bank of America owns that number, so nothing special is generally needed to do an A-level attestation from the AT&T side. So I just really want to clarify here that you can sign any number attestation A. You do not have to have given it to anybody. It can be a toll-free number. That's a big one that's come up. Uh, whether you're the rest board that gave it to them or you're not the rest board, it doesn't matter. But if you sign a call out to station A, you have to have established a verified association with the telephone number that's being used for the call. That's the extent of the detail provided. Um, it's not any more detail, whatever you feel you need to do to meet that requirement. Your regulatory and legal teams are likely the ones who make that decision. But that's, that's, that's very, um, very important here from a, a shaken perspective. And then at the station C, the, the one that Donald was talking about a little bit earlier, this is maybe the most uh, confusing attestation level for, for some, especially recently. So attestation C was really originally designed for the scenario uh, where a call comes in from overseas to a U.S. carrier that, you know, is taking it off a, an international gateway. A common example, you know, let's say AT&T, they're obviously one of the larger carriers from, from a transit standpoint. They receive a call from some country, let's say the United Kingdom as an example. So United Kingdom sends a call from some carrier in the UK, sends a call to AT&T. AT&T is the first carrier within the shaken ecosystem in the United States. They can sign that call C to say, we're originating the call. We, we are not responsible for the, the calling number. We don't know the enterprise that's making the call. All we know is that this call came from this gateway. And you sign it at the station level C, and then that call transits through the network. And the advantage of doing this is it can make trace back quicker. Because that call may go from AT&T to five other providers before it gets to the final terminating service provider. And I know a lot of work has been done to try and make tracebacks as quick as possible and, 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 and very efficient and, and, and easy. Um, but this is probably still going to be easier no matter what is done in the traceback groups just because a terminating service provider can just immediately, I mean, it's just in the call, knows AT&T received this call. They're who I go ask, where did this call come from? Now, it's not going to get to the source of the call by any means uh, because it's just going to get to the edge of the United States net PSTN network, but it, it immediately gets to AT&T. You don't have to talk to any other carriers in the middle. Uh, and this, of course, also would apply to a non-international call that originated. But the, the intention there is for the first provider that is part of the shaking ecosystem to do attestation C. Now, a lot of the discussion that's been coming around is should intermediate providers sign attestation C, where you've got a originating provider within the US, and then you've got an intermediate provider and then you've got you know, maybe a bunch of other intermediate providers before you finally get to the terminating service provider. Well, the SEC has already made it clear and mandated that the originating service provider sign those calls. And they'll pretty much always sign calls A or B if you're a, a kind of a retail provider. Now, kind of this idea that the intermediate provider signs C doesn't really exactly fit with the standard. And this is why what kind of Donald mentioned most of those transit providers, or at least many of the transit providers, are actually not even service providers um, in, in the sense that they don't own numbers. They provide transit service. So they couldn't sign that to see if they want. They're not allowed in the shaken ecosystem. But also, it, it can be kind of looked at as a little bit of a waste of resources because if the originating service provider is required to sign an attestation level A, why, why are you requiring the next hop to sign at C? But I think the reality is that some of the reasons that this is coming up at least from the FCC perspective, is because not all originating service providers talk to their 
intermediate providers, those transit providers via SIP. There's a lot of TDM there. And so I think what's really coming down is, is there's some, this idea of, well, we'll sign it as soon as we can. Um, and that, that's where that attestation C comes from. So I'm not sure what, what's going to end up happening with that attestation C. Again, the original idea was a little bit more, you know, edge of the shaken ecosystem. Um, but it, it's getting changed a little bit. And, and with kind of the, all the TDM out there, I'm not sure what's going to happen. And of course, the last thing I will mention, you know, shaken was originally designed to be in the United States. Um, Canada has its own shaken, but other countries are going to implement shaken too. And it looks like the way this is going to work out, and there's a lot of work being done in, in the ADAS working groups to, to figure this out, but it looks like each carrier is going to have their own shaken ecosystem within the country. But then there's going to be some information sharing from a certificate standpoint between those countries so that you can utilize the other countries at the station levels. So a carrier in the UK could actually sign the call and then it could pass all the way through AT&T, let's say they take it off you know, from the ocean and then goes to the terminating service provider. That terminating service provider might actually verify the call from the UK signature, not an AT&T gateway at the station. Gateway at the station is really the best we can do for certain call flows, so it's there, but the goal should always be to do at station A or, or B when possible, because that gives you a sense of who the enterprise is, who the bad guy that's making these calls is and makes trace back to them much quicker. Now, in addition to the attestation level, as an originating service provider, you can set an origination identifier. Uh, and this is intended to be a UUID, which uh, I kind of have an example here of a, a UUID, and there's a couple different versions of this, but they all look similar to this, um, that is unique and opaque. It's not intended to, to supply any information, you know, like to say that this is Bank of America. You wouldn't want your UUID to, to indicate who the subscriber is or anything like that from a privacy standpoint. So it's intended to be opaque, but it's used really for two purposes, for reputation and for traceback. So reputation systems may start to utilize this and say, okay, I'm seeing a lot of calls that people are marking as spam with this origination identifier. That indicates maybe future calls with this origination identifier are bad, or maybe the inverse. This origination identifier, people are saying, anytime I mark a call as, as these, from this origination identifier, if I mark it as spam, if I think it's spam, someone always says, no, that was a false positive, that might play into it as well. So it can be used for both positive and negative reputation, as well as for traceback. You know, the idea being a turning service provider gets a call, the, the subscriber says, this, this is a spam call, they're trying to defraud me, pretending to be the IRS, you know, whatever it is that they're trying to do that's bad. And the terminating service provider can go to the originating service provider. Again, they know immediately who the originating service provider is because they're, they're, the OCN is in the certificate and say, I got a call at this timestamp with this origination ID. This customer's misbehaving. And it makes it very quick for that originating service provider to identify that call. Now, how you set this origination identifier actually varies based on what the attestation level is. So if the attestation level is attestation A, the highest level, the idea is, in general, the carrier is going to use a single identifier or maybe a pool of identifiers for different regions. And really, this is a little bit you know, kind of most focused on the big wireless providers, where carriers kind of set the number within their network. There's really no spoofing going on because there's no PBXs. Uh, it's really pretty simple. So you just use the same origination ID for every call that leaves the big IMS core network. Now that, that works that works fine, uh, but when you get into enterprises where you're like more likely to have at station level B, that can be a little bit more complicated. And so this is where you're supposed to say um, basically a unique ID per customer. Now you may have a, a set of unique IDs or UUIDs per customer. Let's say you have you know five. Again, I'll go back to Bank of America to give a real world example. Let's say they have five offices where they have PBXs, just as an example, and they. Uh, maybe have a different unique identifier for each office so that if one office started making a bunch of bad calls and the reputation was bad, then it would only affect that one office. And Or from a traceback perspective, it immediately tells you not only that it's Bank of America, but which office at Bank of America. So that there's you know a couple different options that as a carrier you have. Generally being more granular can make traceback easier, but it's a little bit more to manage where you have to manage all these UUIDs, the more you have, of course. And then for attestation C, the idea is to identify the gateway. So let's say, again, going back to a real-world example, AT&T has 20 gateways that they take international calls in. 
the recommendations are to have a single identifier per gateway, or you could, again, you could potentially have multiple identifiers per gateway, but so that you immediately trace back to a specific gateway and not to just any international call. So that's kind of how these the origination IDs are, are intended to be used. They are a little bit more recommendations than requirements where the attestation values are a little bit more, you know, you must do it this way. Origin IDs, you have all, quite a bit more flexibility, but in general, you do not want to be more broad than what these recommendations are, where you just assign every call the same UUID. Um, you know, even if it's not necessarily going to get you in trouble, it might have negative impacts on your customer if one of your customers is making a bunch of spam calls and that UUID is now marked as being a spammer, it affects everybody who has that same UUID. I know I've seen some people have talked about just using a random UUID for every single call because they don't want reputation systems using that uh, and they want, they still get the traceback benefits, but they don't allow anybody to use reputation systems. That's a valid approach if you want to do that. I haven't seen anything in the standards to indicate that you're not allowed to do that. Um, but uh, you, know, you definitely have some flexibility there. Now, the last thing I do I, I want to talk about is, is just a little bit about what the integration looks like and how you take some network and, and start signing calls with that network. And this is going to be a, a generally a, a big simplification of what a network looks like. Um, and I just want to talk about the pros and cons of where people are deploying authentication services and kind of the effects that those have. Um, on networks and then talk about one specific use case that's a little bit unique. So here's a, a shaken deployment that's done at the switch. Uh, and, and what I'm kind of with this network I'm showing is you've got some, some calling party. And again, this is an all SIP network. And that, that calling party, let's say it's, you know, hosted PBX in this case, or it could be, um, you know, a, 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 a trunk as well. But in this case, we'll say it's hosted PBX. They register with your switch through some ingress SBC. And then that call leaves your network through some egress SBC, goes out to the SIP network, um, you know, whoever else that, that is that you have peering relationships with. A very common deployment that we see is this switch level deployment. And there's some advantages and then there's some disadvantages to this. So from an advantage side, the switch is generally where most people do a lot of their subscriber management. It's where you know if someone is spoofing or not spoofing. You know, okay, this calling party is using a, a number that I gave them, or they're not. A lot of switches are now getting configured a little bit differently than they historically have, where carriers are actually preventing customers from spoofing to simplify management. You know, they say, I, I've given them these five DIDs. If they use something different, I reject the call. I don't let, let them make outbound calls. You could, of course, sign it at, at station B instead of that. Um, but a lot of carriers are, are choosing to just not allow that to happen. Um, because, you know, signing it at station B, you know, from a carrier perspective, you're not going to get in trouble. But people might say, okay, that, that's a spammer. You know, they need to stop making phone calls. And then you, you need to shut down that enterprise. And it's maybe easier to just prevent them in the first place than having to have that happen after the fact. But that's all, you know, local policy. You guys can decide whatever you want to do there. But this, this deployment is nice because this tends to be a nice point of management. But one of the downsides to this is you sign every single call, even those calls that go right back to another subscriber hanging off of that switch, or you can, depending on how you integrate the switch. And that can be inefficient from a cryptography standpoint. Well, it's not a big deal by any means. Signing a call is, does have some cryptography in it. And the, the math associated with that cryptography is much more complex than the you know, basic handling of a, of a, of a phone call. Uh, there's a lot of operations involved there, so it can put a bigger load on that, that authentication service the more calls that you have. So that's kind of one of the downsides here. Um, you also have to be careful to make sure you authenticate the call at the switch and then verify the call at the switch or where you place your verification matters. Uh, because, you know, again, those on net calls kind of have a funny scenario where they, they don't go out to the SIP network like we're talking here. They actually go right back to a subscriber and there could be some things to, to think about there. So this is a very common deployment um, because it generally does pretty well. But again, it does have some things you have to be very careful about, particularly on net calls. This is definitely a far less common um, deployment that we see, but it is something, depending on how your network looks, that, that I've definitely seen a fair number of people do. Um, so in this scenario, what we're showing is that the calls are actually signed as they leave a carrier's network. 
Now, the, the big thing that, that people like about this is you only sign calls that are leaving your network. You're not signing on net calls, and that's good and bad. You don't want to waste that cryptography, but you also don't want calls that come from another carrier into your network to look verified, but when it's one of your own subscribers to a different subscriber, it doesn't look verified. That's, that's not good, but I'll, I'll talk about the, how people are solving that uh, a little bit later today, and then also actually next month, there's some other, other techniques that you can use. Um, but this this deployment ha has some advantages there. There's also some some potential issues with this deployment, depending on where you're where you're doing your your uh, routing. Or actually, I say it's issues, but it actually can be both an issue and a benefit. So where this comes down to is failover. If if you're you know let's say you have a call again, I think it helps if I use real world examples. So AT and T, they have, make a phone call, they send it. Verizon and for whatever reason Verizon can't accept that call so they send it to Sprint. I know these are not transit providers that doesn't make a lot of sense but I'm just kind of give names to make it simple. What do you want to happen from a signature standpoint? Should the first call have been signed and then should the second call be signed again or should it be reusing that same signature from on both of those calls? I say both calls it's, you know, it's the same call it's just a, a reattempt on a different provider and this can have some implications to that. If your call comes out of your switch, goes to the egress SBC, is signed, and then goes to the SIP, out to the SIP network, they fail the call, it goes all the way back to your switch, and then that whole process happens again, but to a different provider over here, then you've signed that call twice. Now, obviously, that's a waste of resources, but the advantage of that is there's now a new timestamp, a new fresh timestamp on that signature that, or on that token that was created. Now, if you do your routing at your egress SBC, the call leaves your switch, goes to the egress SBC, comes up as signed, and then goes out to the, the carrier A, it fails, comes back here, goes to carrier B. It's not signed again because it never goes back to the switch, never goes to the authentication service again. Obviously, that reduces resources, but if you have five, 10 failures, unlikely, but definitely happens in some scenarios, that could take 30 seconds even, maybe. I've seen some long PDDs there. That can have an implication for the fact that that token, by the time it reads the terminating service writer, could be stale if you signed it 30, 45, 60 seconds ago. In general, most verification services are going to use 60 seconds. Um, but a lot of people want to lower those, those time limits um, down as low as they can, and, and these types of scenarios have an effect on that. So that's, that's something to consider. Now, from a, the last call flow, I, I want to mention kind of a unique setup that I know some of the bigger wireless carriers are doing, if not most of the bigger wireless carriers. Um, just from a an, you know, network optimization standpoint, this, this is kind of a clever, clever way of deploying this. Um, this is not in any way documented in any of the standards. So again, kind of looking at this, you've got the calling party, the ingress SBC, switch and egress SBC. And what they've actually done is they've broken the authentication service into two sections, two portions. One of them is tagging the calls. It's setting what the attestation level should be, what that original ID should be. And then the other function is actually signing it. In setting the attestation level, setting the original ID has no cryptography. It's very low from a resource utilization. It's actually signing the call that has all the, the higher resource utilization. So a call comes into the switch, they tag that call. Typically using P headers, there's a 3GPP standard for the headers that are used, um, but, but uh, you can kind of do this however you wanted to. And, and that call is tagged with the origination ID and the attestation value. And then if it leaves your network, it goes to the egress SBC, and the egress SBC has, I'll call it a dumb authentication service hanging off of it. It just gets a call from the egress SBC and signs it as those that tagging that's on the call tells it to do. It doesn't know how to handle the call. It's just signing it the way the tagging says to. So from an egress perspective, not a lot changes. But what's nice about this model is for on-net calls, a call that comes from the calling party ingress SBC switch and then goes back out to another subscriber on your network, you never hit this authentication service with the cryptography. You just tag the call. And, and one of the things, and I'll talk a lot more about this when we talk about verification that these tagging services are doing, is they're actually both tagging the call for authentication and they're pretending that the call was verified for use within the network so that the call, if it leaves the switch, goes to another subscriber, it actually looks like it was verified. 
And again, I'll, I'll talk more about how that verification looks and, and how that works when we talk about verification. Um, but that that this method has been deployed by a number of the big wireless carriers, uh, if not if not all of them. All of the, the deployments that I know of on the big wireless carriers are all, all look like this. It's a very uh, efficient way of doing things. Um, doesn't fit for every network though. Uh, tends to be more deployed in IMS networks. Now that's really what I wanted to talk about from a, a, a shaken authentication standpoint. Obviously there's a lot more complexity that we didn't get into, but that's that's kind of the <laughs> 10,000 foot overview of, of what shaken authentication looks like. 